Anna Seewald and this is Authentic Parenting, a podcast about personal development in the context of parenting, where I explore how you can find more calm, connection and joint parenting through the process of self-discovery and inner growth with a trauma-informed lens. I'm a parent educator and my mission is to help children by helping parents. The motto of this podcast is raising our children, growing ourselves. Today, why you can't pay attention and how to think deeply again. Have you noticed that your ability to pay attention is collapsing? Here is what happened to me today. I was working on this introduction while waiting for my client to show up for his Zoom call and all of a sudden, It dawned on me that the book I ordered from Amazon a week ago hasn't arrived yet. Oh, let me quickly check the status of the order, I said to myself. I opened Amazon and while the page was loading, I quickly switched the tab and glanced at my email to see if there was anything new. Since my client was late, I decided to check Facebook. I don't go on Facebook daily, I don't have the app on my phone, so when I log in, I have to attend to batch notifications. I normally go into my group, the Authentic Parenting community, to see if anyone or anything requires my attention. There was actually a very disturbing post and while I normally don't respond when I'm agitated or angry with e-communication, whether it's a text message or an email, I couldn't resist. I started crafting my comment. After some time, when I looked at my recent Amazon orders, I noticed that the book was still in my cart. So I guess I never placed the order because I got distracted by something that day. I am positive you can relate. Did you know that in the United States, teenagers can focus on one task for only 65 seconds at a time and office workers average only three minutes? Like so many of us, today's guest, Johan Hari, was finding that constantly switching from device to device and tab to tab was a diminishing and depressing way to live. He went on a quest to find out what was happening to our attention and he wrote a remarkable book called Stolen Focus, Why You Can't Pay Attention and How to Think Deeply Again. He argues in the book that our focus has been stolen by some powerful external forces. Hari found that there are 12 deep causes of this crisis from the decline of the mind-wandering to rising pollution, all of which have rubbed some of our attention. Hari says that we can reclaim our focus as individuals and as a society if we are determined to fight for it. Johan Hari is a writer and journalist. He is written for the New York Times, Le Monde, The Guardian, and other newspapers, His famous TED Talks and now this viral video have been viewed almost 100 million times. And his work has been praised by a broad range of people from Oprah Winfrey to Noam Chomsky to Joe Rogan. He was the executive producer of the Oscar-nominated film The United States vs. Billie Holiday and of a forthcoming eight-part TV series starring Samuel L. Jackson. He's written books on the topics of depression, the war on drugs, and the British monarchy. His three previous books are God Save the Queen, Chasing the Scream, First and Last Days of the War on Drugs, and Lost Connections, Uncovering the Real Causes of Depression and the Unexpected Solutions. Today we explore why do we need to pay attention to our attention, how childhood is happening behind closed doors, and how the lack of free unstructured play and movement is affecting children, 
the myth of multitasking and the switch cost effect, why tech is not the only invader of our attention, and why the solutions to reclaim our attention require both individual and collective approaches and so much more. This is not a conversation about being pro-tech or anti-tech. I love Johan's brilliance, his sense of humor, and his optimism. I wish I had two more hours with him. I will have links to his books, TED Talks, website, and social media, and everything else that we mentioned in this episode in the show notes. And please be sure to check out his new book, Stolen Focus. I highly recommend it. And now please enjoy this thought-provoking, deep and eye-opening conversation with Johan Hari. Johan, I am so honored and delighted. I absolutely loved this phenomenal book. It's oh, so you. well written, your storytelling, it's I couldn't put it down. I'm like, I want to know. I want to finish this story and the research and the amount of work you put into it. It's just brilliant. I mean, you're a brilliant thinker and a different thinker. You, Your TED Talks have inspired so many people. I've been following you for many years. Um, it's just phenomenal. I think this is going to be my top book of the year. I usually... Oh, wow. I read a lot of books, um, even though the, the number of people who read and the numbers have declined. I do read a lot. 54 books I read last year. And uh, every year I do a, a top 10 and I share with my audience. I think this is going to be number one for this oh, wow. year. That's so nice. And I haven't even started the year. So <laughs> <laughs> I just want to stress to the audience that I have not bribed Anna to say any of those things. Uh, sure. Uh, thank you so much. That's what a lovely thing to say. Thank you. Yes. So I would love for you to tell the story that instigated you to to start this journey of writing this book and researching. I, I think it's it's so powerful. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm so moved by what you just said, Anna. Thank you. For me, you know, I had been thinking about this subject of attention for a long time, but there was a moment in my life where I thought, oh, okay, you're going to have to write about this. You're going to have to investigate this. So I've got a godson who I call Adam in the book. And when he was nine, he developed this brief but freakishly intense obsession with Elvis. And it was particularly cute because he didn't know that Elvis had become a kind of cheesy cliche. So he was singing like Viva Las Vegas and Suspicious Minds with complete sincerity. And one day when I was tucking him into bed, well, every night actually he would get me to tell him the story of Elvis's life again and again. I tried to skip over the bit at the end where Elvis dies on a toilet. And one night I was talking about Graceland where Elvis lived and he looked at me very intensely and he said, Johan, will you take me to Graceland one day? And I said, sure, the way you do with nine-year-olds, when you're like, next week they'll say Legoland or whatever. And he said, no, do you really promise one day you're going to take me to Graceland? And I said, I absolutely promise. And I didn't think of it again for 10 years until so many things had gone wrong. So he, he dropped out of school when he was 15. And by the time he was 19, he was just spending almost literally every waking moment alternating between WhatsApp, YouTube, porn, Snapchat, just this, this kind of blur. And, and it was almost like he was whirring at the speed of Snapchat where nothing still or serious could touch him. And one day we were sitting on my sofa just behind where my laptop is now. And I was trying to talk to him and just nothing was getting any traction. He wouldn't look away from his screens. And to be totally honest with you, Anna, I wasn't much better. I was looking at my own devices. And I suddenly remembered this moment all those years before. And I said to him, hey, let's go to Graceland. And he was like, what? He didn't even know what I was talking about. He couldn't remember it. I was like, no, we have to break this numbing routine. This is no way to live. Let's go to Graceland. Let's go all over the South. Let's go really soon. But you've got to promise me one thing, which is that when we go, you'll leave your phone in the hotel, right? You won't we won't we can't no point going if you're just gonna stare at your phone all day 
And he said, yeah, I could see it really excited something in him. And two, he made the promise. And two weeks later, we flew from London Heathrow to New Orleans. And a few weeks after that, we arrived in Memphis and we went to Graceland. And when, when you arrive at the gates of Graceland now, this is even before COVID, there's no person to show you around. What happens is you're handed an iPad and you put in some earbuds and the iPad shows you around. It says, you know, go left, go right. And every room you're in tells you a little story about that room. And, and it shows you a picture of that room on the iPad. So what happens is everyone just walks around Graceland staring at their iPad. And I was like, kind of all, half amused, half appalled. So I'm kind of trying to make eye contact with someone to kind of go, this is funny. We're the people who traveled thousands of miles and actually looked at the place we traveled to, but I couldn't get eye contact going with anyone. And we, we went into the jungle room, which was Elvis's favorite room in Graceland. And there was a Canadian couple next to us. And the man turned to his wife and he said, honey, this is amazing. Look, if you swipe left, you can see the jungle room to the left. And if you swipe right, you can see the jungle room to the right. And I, I burst out laughing. I was like, <laughs> you know, and, I, and then I turn and look and, and they're just swiping back and forth. And I, I leaned over and I said, hey, sir, there's an old fashioned form of swiping you could do. It's called turning your head because look, we're in the jungle room. You don't have to look at it on a screen. We're, we're actually there. And this guy looked at me like I was completely insane and him and his wife backed away. And I turned to my godson to, to laugh about it. And he was standing in the corner, looking at Snapchat, staring at it. Because from the minute we landed, he could not stop. He just could not stop. And I kind of stormed up to him. And I said, I know you're afraid of missing out, but this is guaranteeing that you'll miss out. You're not present at your own life. You're not showing up to the events of your own existence. And he kind of stormed off. And I wandered around Memphis on my own that afternoon. And then that night, I found him in the Heartbreak Hotel where we were staying up the street. And he was sitting by the guitar shaped swimming pool. And I went up to him and I, he, he was staring at his phone and I, I apologized. And he didn't look up from Snapchat, but he said, I know something's really wrong, but I don't know what it is. And I thought, wow, we we came here to escape this problem of being present, of failing to be present. But everywhere we went, people were failing to be present, right? It was all around us. And that's when I thought, I want to try to figure out, has something changed with our attention? Has, has it always been like this? If something's changed, what is it? And most importantly, what can we do about it? I know. Excellent question. And everybody knows deep inside, everybody's struggling with this. I know a woman who is in her 70s and she used to take care of her grandchildren before the pandemic, but then the pandemic hit. And of course she has a smartphone, but the pandemic hit and she lives alone and she was locked in her own apartment. She became so addicted to her device that when everything opened up, she went to take care of her grandchildren. And her daughter said to me, my mom is so addicted. She cannot even take care of my kids. She's constantly on her phone. She can't be present anymore. So this is happening not only to our kids. It's, this is across mm. the board. It's, this is happening to everyone. Good. That's so interesting, Anna. I'm just thinking about that story. That's so heart-wrenching. And we will have all, we all know people in that position. And it was, you know, it's interesting to me because when I came back from Memphis and I was thinking about this a lot, I was thinking, you know, it seemed to me like I could feel this happening to myself. It felt like things that required deep focus, things that are very important to my sense of self, like reading a book, having long conversations. It felt like with each year that passed, they were getting more and more like running up a down escalator. You know, I could still do them, but they were getting harder and harder. And I wanted to understand this even very early on looking at the statistics on this, it was quite shocking you know, the average American office worker now focuses on any one task for only three minutes. For every one child who was diagnosed, identified with serious attention problems when I was seven years old, there's now a hundred children who've been identified with that problem. So to get to the bottom of this, I used my training in the social sciences at Cambridge University to go on a really big journey from Miami to Moscow to Melbourne to interview over 200 of the leading experts on focus and attention, different aspects of it. And what I learned from them is there's scientific evidence for 12 factors 
that can make your attention better or can make your attention worse. So they include some aspects of our tech, but actually go way beyond our tech, from the food we eat to the sleep we don't get. There's a huge array of factors here. And, and I learned that loads of these factors that can make your attention worse have been significantly rising in recent years. So it's not just an anecdotal impression. It's not, not just what you think or I think. There's, there's good evidence for this. And crucially, your attention didn't collapse. Your attention has been stolen from you by some very big forces. And once you understand that, it opens up a very different set of solutions that we can pursue together. So, Johan, I think it would be best to define what attention is for the listener, even though most of us know what attention is. We don't really need a definition. It's like beauty, right? Do you know what it, <laughs> you like? You know what it is, but it would be good to define. And most importantly, why do we need to care about this? I think you argue it so well. I want people to know that this is not just, oh, attention, why do we even have to care about this? Why it's so important and what are the benefits of paying attention, having that focus? Yeah, so before we give the definition, I would just say to anyone listening, think about anything you've ever achieved in your life that you're proud of, whether it's starting a business, being a good parent, learning to play the guitar, that thing you're proud of took a huge amount of sustained focus and attention. And when attention and focus break down, as I would argue they clearly are, your ability to achieve your goals is significantly diminished. Your ability to solve your problems is significantly diminished. This is why this is so important. In terms of how we define attention, there's a kind of textbook definition, and then I think there's a better definition. So the kind of standard definition comes from William James, who's the kind of founder of modern American psychology. And generally, attention is defined is your ability to selectively attend to things in your environment. So think about the fact I'm talking to you from my apartment in London. So if I turn my head just a little bit out the window, I can see cars going by. I can see people going by in the corner of the room here. I've got my television in another corner of the room somewhere. I've deliberately hidden it is my phone, which might be flashing at me. Um, I can hear my heating. If I listen, if I tune my heat, tune my hearing a little bit, I can hear the radiator over there. I can hear the wind because it's a very windy day in London. There's a storm. And I'm filtering out all of that and I'm selectively attending to you. What did Anna ask me? She asked me what attention is, right? So that's the kind of standard definition of attention. I would actually say there's a better definition. It comes from a, a wonderful man named Dr. James Williams, who I would argue is the leading philosopher of attention. William in the world James today. and I know. <laughs> it's like it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> I like this little like, I originally had a little riff on that in the book, and my editor said that's no, too pretentious, take it out. But I do like the fact that you've got, you know, the end of the 19th century, William James gives a definition, and then, you know, whatever it is, 120 years later, you've got James Williams doing it. So James Williams worked at the heart of Google part of the machinery that's so deeply invading our attention. He became incredibly uncomfortable with what he was doing, quit and became this wonderful philosopher of attention. And he argues there are three layers of attention. I would argue there's a fourth. I know he would agree with this because I talked about it with him. So the first layer of attention is basically what we just talked about. It's what's generally called your spotlight. So let's say I just took a break in this podcast to go and get a Diet Coke from the fridge. Let's say if while I was walking to the fridge, I had my phone with me, I got interrupted by a text. I read the text, I start responding, and then I forget why I went to the, fri went to the fridge and come <laughs> back into this room. That would be a disruption of my spotlight. So your spotlight is your ability to do kind of immediate tasks. And when we think about attention problems, that's generally the layer we think about, right? We think about your ability to be disrupted while you're doing immediate things. That's a real layer, and that is being hugely disrupted. The next layer up is what Dr. Williams calls your starlight. And your starlight is your kind of medium or longer term goals. So it's not, I want to get a Coke from the fridge. It's, I want to set up a business. I want to write a book. You know, I want to get a new job, whatever it might be, right? So it's more medium and long term. It's called your starlight because when you're lost in the desert and you want to remember where you're going, you look to the stars and they tell you what direction you're traveling in. And Dr. Williams argues, I think very persuasively, that our starlight is being profoundly disrupted. If you're distracted all the time, if you never have time to reflect deeply, your ability to, to formulate and achieve your, your ability to achieve your long-term goals is disrupted. The next layer is what he calls your daylight. And that's 
your ability to even know what your long-term goals are. How do you know you want to start a business? How do you know what you want to write a book about? How do you know what it means to be a good parent? To formulate those things, you need to have lots of periods in your life where you reflect deeply, you pause, you let your mind wander, generally you read, you need to think deeply. But, but what's happening is we're being so jammed up by these constant interruptions and distractions that we don't get the contemplation necessary for daylight. And he calls it daylight because you can see a room most clearly when it's flooded with daylight. We, we can't see clearly. But I would argue the fourth layer of attention is what I would call your, our stadium lights. And that's our ability to see each other as a society, our ability to achieve our collective goals. And I would argue, you know, that's really falling apart, right? Even in the face of crises as severe as the climate crisis or COVID, we can't do anything but scream at each other. It's not a coincidence, I think, that all over the world, at the same time that we're experiencing an attention crisis, we're experiencing severe political crises and the biggest crisis in democracy since the 1930s. Now, this isn't the only cause, obviously, that would be a ridiculous thing to say, but I do think it's playing a role. So I think all these layers of attention are currently being disrupted and that's and it's affecting our ability to solve our problems and achieve our goals. And that's why it's so important that we understand these 12 causes and most importantly, deal with them. I, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> Hey, do you love the podcast? Show your support by becoming a patron on patreon.com and join our 15 existing members who believe and support the work of authentic parenting. Patreon is a place where creators, artists, and podcasters get support from their fans. Your contribution makes a difference. When you become a patron at any level, I'll send you a handwritten thank you card with some awesome authentic parenting merch. A tote bag, a pen, a t-shirt, a mug. You'll be part of the special insider's circle and get other benefits as well. Discounts on my services and offerings, extra content, and of course, exclusive access to me. You can stop your contribution at any time. A lot goes into the production of the podcast, and I truly need your help. Head over to patreon.com forward slash authentic parenting. The link is in your show notes as well. And join other big hearted and generous listeners from around the world. It's not the amount that matters. It's the fact that you give that matters. After all, I created this podcast and built our community on the notion of giving. We have different levels of support starting from $2 a month. If you break it down, it comes down to 50 cents per episode. $2 can't even get you a cup of hot drink in a major U.S. city. Thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being part of our global, diverse, and strong community. Your support truly matters. Simply visit patreon.com forward slash authentic parenting and choose a level of support today. Again, visit patreon.com forward slash authentic parenting and choose a level of support. Now, back to the show. I speak at conferences to early childhood education specialists. And uh, I think five years ago, I created a presentation. And it's usually about addressing children's misbehavior in a classroom, handling difficult behaviors because they're on a rise, right? Children don't pay attention. Mm, they can sit mm. still, especially younger children. And when I first was creating that talk, it's very interesting. It's very similar to the things that you mentioned in your book, the causes, the food, mm. the pollution. I talk about all of those global things. And then I go into the classroom and how they're all interrelated, how children don't play outside anymore, how it's endangered for those to play who need it the most, all of those mm. factors that you write in your book. And um 
I, my daughter was maybe 10 years old at the time. And I said, I'm very nervous. I'm doing this keynote talk. Can you sit here for a moment? Mommy wants to present it to you. Be my audience. Let me hear myself speak. And when I did the opening of that talk, my daughter said, mom, that's so depressing. <laughs> And I, I use that in my talks now when I give that talk and it's the most popular presentation I do each year mm. for multiple times. Yes, it is depressing, but yes, we can do something about it. That's so important that both parts of what you've just said, Anna, are so important, aren't they? Because one thing that's very, very important to me in all my books is it's easy to describe problems, right? And, and, and necessary to describe problems. But I never want people to read my books and think, oh my God, we're just screwed then, right? Because the truth is, these problems are big, but they are absolutely soluble, right? That I, in fact, I went to places that had begun to build solutions to many of these problems. So let's think if it's okay, Anna, with about one of the things you just named, which is so important of the 12 factors that I write about in Stolen Focus. I think this is the one that most pulls at my heart, actually, although they're all important to me which is what we've done to childhood and particularly what's happened in the last two years, the many tragedies of the past two years. I think there's a layer of it that relates to this. So one of the heroes of my book is a woman called Lenore Skenazi. Do you, do you know Lenore? I know her, the free range parenting oh, person. Isn't she an incredible, she a, a is, really yes. remarkable person? Yeah. Every now and then in life, you know, you meet lots of people who describe problems and sometimes in life you meet people who envision the solution. And sometimes very occasionally you meet people who brilliantly describe the problem, envision the solution, and then build the solution, right? Mm -hmm. And those are the people, people who are just golden. And Lenore, I think, is building a solution that every single person who's a parent who's listening or a grandparent, you can act on this tomorrow. You can contact her organization. You can begin to build this. Mm -hmm. So Lenore, Lenore grew up in a suburb of Chicago in the 1960s. And from when she was five years old, she would leave her home on her own first thing in the morning, and she would walk to school on her own. She would generally bump into all the other five, six, seven-year-olds who were also walking to school on their own because everyone walked to school on their own. I walked to school. I don't know. Did I you, did too. You yeah, did me too. too? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right? So right. We're, we're, we're the last, we're, we're about the same age. We're the last people who can say that right at the moment in the world, uh, in the Western world. And when, actually when Lenore got to the school, there was a busy road. So there was a 10-year-old boy whose job was to help the five-year-olds cross the street, right? And when school ended, Lenore left on her own with all her friends. They would play freely, run around, and they would go home when they were hungry. This is what childhood looked like for pretty much everyone until very recently. By the time you got to the 1990s, when Lenore was a mom in Queens in New York, that had almost completely ended. You were expected to deliver your child to school like a package and be waiting to collect them at the end of the day. By 2003, only 10% of American children ever played outside without adult supervision. And I think of the 10% that did play outside, they got an average of like 12 minutes a week. So essentially it ended, right? Childhood became something that happened behind closed doors and under adult supervision. And it turns out a lot of the things that we've lost in childhood were, were and are essential for children to be able to form a healthy ability to pay attention. To give a real no shit Sherlock one, exercise. The evidence is overwhelming. People like Professor Joel Nigg, the leading expert on children's attention problems in the United States, have shown this very clearly. Children who get to run around have more brain connections, they're more mentally healthy. And one of the best things you can do for kids who are struggling to focus is let them go or run around, right? So I don't think I need to give much more evidence for that. I think it's pretty obvious to everyone. Uh, but I can't, obviously, I can give more evidence if you want. Also, even more importantly, when children play freely, with other children without adults standing over them, they learn all sorts of things about how to deploy attention and use attention. They learn what they find interesting. They learn how to persuade other kids to pay attention to them. They learn how to take their turn and pay attention to other kids. They learn how to cope with fear and anxiety, which are extremely important for being able to pay attention. And if you have an adult standing over the kids, telling them what to do, regulating, imposing the rules, you don't get those benefits, right? It's like the difference between processed food and naturally occurring food. Um, you just, you don't get the benefit. So Lenore saw all of this. She knows many of the leading scientists who've discovered this, like Professor Jonathan Haidt, 
Dr. Isabel Benke, amazing Chilean scientist. But Lenore at first thought, okay, well, what I have to do here is just persuade individual parents. So she would go to parents and she'd say to them, what is something you did when you were a kid that you loved that you don't allow your own children to do? That's a brilliant question, isn't it? What would be your answer, mm -hmm. Anna? My answer would be I played outside most of the time. <laughs> yes. Um, and we did everything from starting fires to uh, <laughs> to stealing fruits from other people's gardens, mis <laughs> mischievous things, to pulling pranks. But I'm a different parent, Johan. Mm. I'm not your typical parent. I do as much as possible allow my daughter the same type of freedoms. Now, it's, really... not, it's not exactly the same. Don't get me wrong. But because the lifestyle is different, because I lived in a small town where there were streets and uh, you can cross and there were sidewalks. But I currently live in a place there are no sidewalks. If I want to go to the post office in my town, I have to drive, which is 15 minute walk ridiculously. But oh. I do walk there and my neighbor says, how did you walk to the post office? I'm like, <laughs> this, is, this is how I go, even though there are no walking paths, right? So a lot is different in America. I didn't grow up in America. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Armenia, life was very different. But e even in small towns in the United States, where there are sidewalks, people are not playing outside. We no, know totally. ch childhood has changed. People are scared of things that don't even exist, right? I allow well, my is... daughter to go and skateboard by herself, to go to her friend's house at night, things like that as much as possible again. But there are constrictions from the environment. and You're so right. And this is partly what Lenore discovered, right? Which was you can persuade individual parents. They will very often agree with you. But if you're the only parent who sends your child out, the child gets scared. You look like a crazy person. People call the police. People call the cops, right? Regularly. <laughs> but now when people see 10 year olds, 11, even 11, 12 year olds in the street, they often ring the police and often child services get involved, right? So what Lenore decided to do, she, she began to run an incredible organization called Let Grow, letgrow.org. I really recommend everyone go to it. And what Let Grow do is they go to whole schools and whole communities and persuade everyone to give their children increasing levels of independence, building up to allowing them to play outside. So I spent a lot of time with Let Grow projects in, in, in Long Island. I think of all the hundreds of conversations I have for the book, I think probably the most moving was with a 14 year old boy in Long Island. And this boy, this was a big, strong boy. He was taller than me, and I'm not sure. Um, until this project had begun nine months before, he had never been allowed out of his house on his own. His parents wouldn't even let him go for a run around the block. And I said to him, why wouldn't your parents let you out? And he said, oh, my parents are scared of all these kidnappings. That's the phrase he used. Um, this is a town in Long Island where the olive oil store is across the road from the French bakery, right? There has never been a kidnapping there. Even in the entire United States, you are three times more likely to be hit by lightning than you are to be kidnapped. Um, but he had a level of fear that would be appropriate if he lived in Syria, right? Um, and then this program began and all the kids started to go outside again. And maybe this sounds melodramatic, but the way the, watching this boy describe what it felt like was like watching a child come to life, right? At the moment, the only place where we allow our children to explore anything is on Fortnite and World of Warcraft. We could hardly be surprised they'd become obsessed with them. And I said to this boy, what did you do? And he said, oh, we used to, we played in the street, right? We played board games. And then he said, we went into the woods and he, he sort of said very confidentially, our cell phones didn't work and we still went there, right? Which to him was like mind blowing. And I said, what did you do in the woods? And he said, oh, we built a fort. And now we go and sit in the fort, even though we can't use our phones there, because it's good to build things. And Lenore was with me that day. And when this boy left, Lenore turned to me and she said, you know, think about human history. All throughout human history, young people had to go out and explore. They had to hunt, they had to forage, they had to map the environment. And in one generation, unprecedentedly, we took all that away. And that boy, given a tiny little bit of freedom, went into the woods and he built a fort. Because this is so deep in human nature. We are profoundly stunting our children. This is not the fault of any individual parent. No one should feel guilty about it. But what we should do is build the solution. 
I would argue every single school in the United States should have a let grow program. We need to restore childhood. And, you know, COVID has been a horrific tragedy, but if anything good can come of this, I think irrespective of what you thought about the COVID restrictions, and I was in favor of them, we can all see that locking our children away has imposed a horrendous cost on them. Horrendous. I mean, I'm not in favor of all the, I was in Las Vegas for a lot of the pandemics. I'm researching a book about it. The fact that the casinos were open and the schools were closed is the sign of a society that has insane priorities. So I don't think all the way the restrictions worked were right. I think we should have prioritized keeping the schools open, certainly ahead of, say, casinos. But we can see that locking our children away for the last two years has had terrible effects on them. That should make us reflect on how close we were to locking them away before this virus first mutated wherever it was in Wuhan, right? And what we need to do, you know, I go through lots of things in Stolen Focus that we need to do in order to restore attention and focus. One of them is we have to restore childhood. We have to give our kids a childhood that our ancestors would have recognized as a human childhood. Because if kids, and this is especially important, and it's by the way, not the only thing we need to do for kids, there's many other things that I talk about in the book, as you know, and we can discuss them. But if kids don't develop focus early, then they're going to struggle their whole life. It, it, you, it, you can still develop it as an adult, but it's obviously going to be harder if you never developed it as a child. You can, I mean, if you don't have attention, if you don't have focus, you're not present in your life. You can't solve yeah. your own problems. You can't do anything in life. And and the bigger forces like the tech and other forces that you describe are going to manipulate you, use you like a puppet and, and tell you what to do. And, and you're going to follow the society. The, we're going to collapse. I mean, I don't want to be pessimistic. I think you, it, it is not your job, Johan, to propose solutions. I think you did, a, even though you propose in your book solutions for systemic change or for individual change, but I don't think it's fair for people to even expect uh, solutions from you. I think what you did phenomenally is you did shed a light. This is crisis. We have to pay attention if we can. If we haven't completely lost our <laughs> attention, we have to pay attention to this because it's not only crisis of attention. This is, this is, this is bigger than that. Have you seen that movie Ex Machina? I'm sure you. Oh yeah, it. ex machina, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's ex good machina, yeah. yeah. Like, uh, like it, it, it scares me that I mean, tech is one of the aspects, obviously, of this. But how, in the end, the the person created, you know, humans created the the machines, but in the end, the machines were more powerful. And, <laughs> you know, and, and, <laughs> and if we don't have attention, and if we are so distracted that's what's going to happen probably. We're not going to even notice we're going to be so distracted. You know, it's um, funny you should say that because I interviewed this guy called Jaron Lanier, who's a great kind of legend in Silicon Valley, a very senior mm -hmm. tech designer and, uh, and a kind of dissident. And uh, he used to advise like dystopian films, like Minority Report, about the kind of technologies, you know, imagining dystopian technologies in the future. And he told me he stopped doing it because he kept designing these technologies that to him were like a vision of a nightmare. And then people in Silicon Valley would see the movie and go, oh, that's really cool. Let's invent that. And he was like, no, no, that's not what I meant at all. Uh, so he stopped doing it for that reason. I think the tech element of this is really important. It's interesting because a lot of people, when they hear, oh, you wrote this book about. They blame the tech right away, right? Exactly. Well, most people say to me, oh, you, oh so you wrote a book about smartphones, right? And it's interesting. And that, when I started, I kind of blame the primary thing I blame is a smartphone. And it's interesting. There's a component in our technology. It's not all of our technology. There's a component in our technology, a very specific component that we can deal with that is profoundly and deliberately hacking and invading our attention. But, and I'll get to that in a second, but I actually think what's interesting is if you think about this technology as like a virus, right? It came along and it would have been powerful at any moment in human history, but it came along at a moment when our collective immune system was already down. We were already doing loads of things that were damaging our attention. I'll give you a real, another no shit Sherlock one. We sleep 20% less than people did a century ago. Children sleep 85 minutes less than they did a century ago. And you need to sleep in order to pay attention. Um, I interviewed uh, the leading sleep experts in the world, many of them. And I remember Dr. Charles Seisler, who's at Harvard Medical School, said to me, even if nothing else had changed, except that we sleep so much less, that alone would be causing 
a huge attention crisis, particularly for children. And we know that with children, lack of sleep manifests not as tiredness, but as mania a lot of the time, right? So they will appear to be running around and unable to pay attention. And this is partly, I wanted to understand why, and it's fascinating, Professor Roxanne Prashad at the University of Minneapolis was one of the people who really helped me to understand this most. We think of sleep as a passive process, like nothing's happening, right? So we say, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead, that kind of thing. Actually, sleep is an incredibly active process. So the whole time you're awake, your brain is building up what's called metabolic waste, uh, or as Professor Prashad put it, you could call it brain cell poop, right? You're building up this brain cell poop throughout the day. And when you go to sleep, your brain is rinsed with a watery fluid, your cerebral spinal fluid channels open, and this metabolic waste is carried down into your down out of your brain down to your liver and eventually out of your body if you don't sleep your brain is literally clogged up that feeling of feeling hungover that you have when you're tired that that's not a metaphor your brain really is clogged up and what's happening is at the moment 40 percent of us are chronically sleep deprived we're getting less than seven hours sleep a night only 15 percent of us wake up feeling refreshed and everyone listening knows if you have a night where you haven't slept well that's much more likely to be a day when you mindlessly scroll through TikTok or Facebook. And there's all sorts of these factors. We're much more stressed than we were not very long ago. Stress profoundly damages your attention and focus. I can talk about how the way we eat is profoundly damaging our attention and focus in three key ways. The way we work is profoundly damaging our attention and focus. So you have this kind of almost like a kind of perfect storm of these factors that any one of them individually would lower our ability to focus and pay attention. But what they do is they leave us wide open for them being invaded by a technology that is, as it's currently designed, technology doesn't have to work this way, is currently designed to hack and invade our attention. And I know saying all that feels really daunting. So I just want to give people a very concrete example of hope from the recent past, which I think is a model for how we can deal with this. So I argue in the book, we have to deal with this at two levels all of these 12 factors. I think of them as defense and offense. There are dozens of things we can all do in our individual lives to protect ourselves and our children. And they will really help. I'm strongly in favor of them. But I also don't want to BS people. I want to be honest with them. They'll really help, but they'll only get you so far. Because at the moment, it's like someone is pouring itching powder into our heads all day, and then leaning forward and going, hey, buddy, you might want to learn how to meditate, then you wouldn't scratch so much. And you want to go, well, screw you. I'll learn to meditate. That's an excellent thing to do. But you need to stop pouring itching powder on me, which is why we need the level of offense where we need to take on the forces that are doing this to us together. And that can sound fancy and abstract. So I'll just give you a very concrete example that I think most listeners will remember. When we were kids, Anna, we were about the same age. Um, it used to be normal, standard, that you would put leaded gasoline in your car. I remember my mother doing it. It, a bit before our time, it was standard that people painted their homes with leaded paint. And it was discovered that exposure to lead is really bad for your brain and particularly screws up children's ability to focus and pay attention. So what happened was a movement of ordinary moms banded together and they said, why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing these for-profit industries to screw with our children's brains? This is crazy. And it's important to notice what they didn't say. They didn't say ban all paint. They didn't say ban all gasoline. They said ban the specific component in the gasoline and in the paint that is harming our kids' attention. They succeeded. Everyone will notice there's no more leaded gasoline. There's no more leaded paint. As a result, the Center for Disease Control, the CDC, has calculated that the average American child is three to five IQ points higher than they would have been had the ban on lead not been introduced. So you can see how that to me is a really good example. We identified something in the atmosphere, in the environment that was profoundly damaging our focus and our attention. And we dealt, we had a collective movement based on the science to get that thing in the environment out of our environment. And as a result, attention improved. Now, obviously at the same time, lots of things came along to invade our attention. But to me, that's a great model. I argue in the book, just like we needed, and of course still need, a feminist movement for women to reclaim their bodies and their lives, I would argue we need an attention movement to reclaim our minds. That involves doing lots of things individually, but it also involves taking on the forces that are doing this, the equivalent of the lead industry today. I, I agree with you that things have to be done on a collective level. 
And I agree that movements are great and they can create changes. But with the lead example, let's say take the lead example mm, and the mm. tech, it's it's not the same impact. People are so people were not addicted to the lead. Nobody was like, oh, I love <laughs> the smell of this. Don't take it away. <laughs> Uh, I, th- I think I agree with you. A movement is necessary to go against all those forces, how it's going to be done, who is going to start, where, in which country, against what. It's complicated. And obviously, it's not up to us to come up with the solutions or to you. You know, what we can do is like what you did. You wrote a brilliant book. We can read. We can talk. We discuss it on a podcast. People are more aware People do individual things. Uh, I do a lot of individual things, uh, even with so much, you know, I have so many restrictions on my child. I have a teenager. She's almost Mm. 14. And I have so many restrictions on my own phone. It's on an individual level. My screen time is still two hours per day. I'm like, holy Mm. cow, like, what am I doing with my phone? (laughs) I don't want it to be two hours. I can do something with those two hours. Mm -hmm. But here is what I did, Johan. I have a private practice. I, you know, I, I therapist, I have a private practice. I work with parents and many people forced me to start a Facebook business page a few years ago. Mm -hmm. I did start the Facebook page, but as you know, you have to pay money for your posts to be seen and, and that kind of stuff. And then you have to maintain it and increase the likes and all of this. I said, who needs this? I don't want to spend my time on the, I don't even get business from Facebook unless I pay Facebook. And <laughs> so I decided I, I hate Facebook with all my heart. I've been a vocal <laughs> about this on my podcast. And what I did was I completely deleted my Facebook. I don't have any other social media except Instagram. I am on Facebook because I have to, I have a group, a private group. Some of the fans of the podcast, the listeners who want to discuss the topics of the podcast are in that group. But here is what Facebook does to me. And and I I, I want to share this with you because you will understand and sympathize. (laughs) So in order to start a group or to have a page, you have to have a personal account. Mm -hmm. However, I don't do anything with my personal account. I don't post pictures of my family and my husband and my life. I don't engage with Facebook because I don't want to spend my time, my life on Facebook. I promote the podcast occasionally, but I just have an account and I never change my profile picture. It's not even my profile picture. It's my logo for my business. So I'm not Facebook's favorite customer, right? Or product, as you say. And as I deleted my fan page also, Here is what Facebook does to me. He penalizes me, punishes me. Mm. And when I post in my own group as an admin so that my listeners can see that the episode we, Johan Hari is released, let's discuss it. Or we have a free support call to help you people. At first, 100 people would see my post over, you know, over 2000 people in, in a group. And then as I... You know, because I also don't look at my newsfeed. I don't like anything on Facebook. I don't engage with Facebook. Facebook penalized me from 100 people who can see my post. Now it's yesterday I posted something, three people. Mm. So this is what Facebook does to me. And I don't want to engage with Facebook. I deleted it and... That's how they want you to be on it, right? Well, I, think, I think what's worth thinking about there, Anna, there's lots of things in what you just said that are so important. It's really worth understanding. I didn't understand this until I did the research for the book. Why Facebook currently works that way and why it doesn't have to work that way. And I learned this from interviewing loads of people in Silicon Valley who have been at the heart of this machine, who had designed the machinery that is obsessing us and our kids. I'll never forget something my friend Tristan Harris, who I think is one of the most important people in the world at the moment, he's um, he'd been at the heart of Google. And he was working on Gmail very early on when it was first being developed and, and widely, it was being widely used across the world, but it was being ramped up. And Gmail is obviously the email service offered by Google. And they were trying to figure out how to get people to use it more often for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. And one day Tristan was sitting in the Googleplex And one of his colleagues said, I've got an idea. Why don't we make it so that every time someone receives an email, 
their phone vibrates. And everyone said, oh, that's a good idea. Let's do that. A week later, Tristan was walking around San Francisco. And everywhere he goes, he just hears this kind of, this buzzing, like a kind of dystopian bird song. And then he realizes, shit, we did that. Me and my colleagues sitting in our office, we did that. Then he realized that that was happening all over the world. Uh, shortly afterwards, he did a calculation. That decision had led to 10 billion interruptions every day across the world, right? 10 billion. And, and he quit and he, and he became one of the leading kind of dissidents in Silicon Valley speaking out. But he was one of the people who really helped me to understand what is currently happening and why. So when you open Facebook, this, this helps to explain why you're having that experience, Anna. When you open Facebook or any of the social media companies, they make money in two ways. The first way is really obvious. You see ads. We all know how that works. The second way is much more valuable. Everything you do on Facebook is scanned and sorted by their artificial intelligence algorithms to learn who you are, right? To figure out all sorts of details about you. You tell your mother you've just bought diapers. Okay, it figures out you've got a baby. You mention to someone that you like Donald Trump. Okay, they know you're a conservative. I'm not saying that's true of you, by the way. Um, you know, you say that you like Bette Midler. Well, if I said that, it would figure out if it's a man who likes Bette Midler, he's gay, right? You can see all sorts of ways in which... The AI has got it's 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 deep. It's it's deep. I recommended someone in a private message on Instagram a book, and they when I log into Facebook a couple of days later, they suggested me to friend the author of that book. Wow. I'm like, it's, holy it's, cow, this is like insane. So these algorithms are learning a huge amount about you. And the reason why is because it's very simple. The more frequently you pick up your phone. And the longer you scroll, the more money they make. That's it. That's the only reason why, right? At the moment, the business model is entirely, you pick up, you scroll, A, you see the ads, B, they learn about you. So they learn the weaknesses in your attention so they can keep you scrolling longer. That's their business model, right? It's very simple. Just like the head of KFC, all he cares about is, did you buy any KFC today, Anna? Right, that's it. That's, I mean, I'm sure as an individual, he's a nice person and cares about other things. I've but never his professional... bought KFC, Johan. I lived in America for 20 years. I've never eaten KFC. I'm sorry to say, Anna, but you should be stripped <laughs> of your citizenship and sent back to Albania. I have eaten KFC in the last 12 hours. So I feel more American than you at this moment. But setting aside that shocking bombshell, which uh, I'm going to come to Princeton and have a KFC with you because I want to witness your first KFC. But the... the what, what you need to understand about these, these business models, and this is what was so interesting to me, is social media doesn't have to work that way, right? We can have social media that is not designed to hack and invade our attention. So one of the people who helped me to understand this is Aza Raskin, who designed a key part of how much of the internet works. And his dad, Jeff Raskin, invented the Apple Macintosh for Steve Jobs. And Aza said to me, look, if you want to solve this problem, the tech component, it's really simple. There's an equivalent to the lead in the lead paint. What you need to do is ban the current business model. And, and but I, is, is that really possible, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And I'll you, tell you why yeah. in a minute. But I'll yeah. just explain why, why, why it matters and then why it's possible. He, he explained to me, because I was trying to get my head around this, and I said to him, okay, well, let's imagine that we do what you say. Right? He said, look, a business model premised on the idea that premised upon hacking people's attention, finding out the weaknesses in it, and selling that attention to the highest bidder is just fundamentally inhuman. It's like lead in lead paint. Do not allow it. And I said to him, okay, let's imagine we do that. What would happen the next day, right? Would I open Facebook and it would say, sorry, everyone, we've gone fishing. He said, of course. <laughs> what would happen is they would have to move to a different business model. And absolutely everyone listening has experience of the two different business models. One is subscription. Okay, everyone knows how Netflix and HBO work. You pay a certain amount, you get access. Another model would be, think about sewers, right? Before we had sewers, we had shit in the streets. People got cholera. It was terrible. So we all pay to maintain the sewers together. And we all own the sewers together. You own the sewers in Princeton. I own the sewers in London and Las Vegas, right? We, we own the sewers in the places where we live. It may be that like we want to own the sewage pipes together. We want to own the information pipes together because we're getting the equivalent of cholera for our attention. But whichever alternative business model we choose, the key thing is all the incentives change. At the moment, the incentives for the designers are 100%, 
How do we get Anna to pick up her phone as often as possible and scroll as long as possible? How do we get Anna's child to pick up her phone as often as possible and scroll as long as possible? But when you move to one of these different business models, suddenly, at the moment, you're not the customer. You're the product they sell to the real customer, the advertisers. But once you're the person who either pays through subscription or owns it through public ownership, you become the customer. Suddenly they have to say, what does Anna want? Oh, Anna wants to be able to pay attention. Let's design the app not to hack her attention, but to heal her attention. Oh, Anna wants to meet up with her friends and look into their eyes face to face because that makes human beings feel better. Great, let's design it to facilitate people meeting up offline rather than avoiding them meeting up offline, which is the way it's designed at the moment. These, th I mean, Tristan and Asa could design that Facebook in a day, right? It's really easy. Why doesn't it happen? It doesn't happen at the moment because the incentives aren't there. And just like the lead industry was never going to say, you know what, guys, I, I think we've just made enough money. Let's, let's just stop poisoning people, right? That, it doesn't work that way. They had to be made to do it. The social media companies need to be made to do it. And in terms of that question you asked, which I obviously asked a lot in the research for the book, can we actually do that, right? When I thought about that, this might sound weird at first, I thought a lot about my grandmothers. So I absolutely loved my grandmothers. Um, my, my Scottish grandmother basically raised me because when I was a child, my dad was in a different country and my mother was ill. Um, when my grandmothers were the age I am now, I'm 43. So they were, they were this age in 1963. One of them was a working class Scottish woman living in um, what would be called a housing project in the US. And the other one was a Swiss peasant woman living in a wooden hut on the side of a mountain. Neither of my grandmothers was allowed to have a bank account in their own name because they were married women. It was legal for their husbands to rape them, as it was legal for men to rape their wives in every single part of the world in 1963. My Swiss grandmother wasn't even allowed to vote. And I think about what their lives were like and how my grandmother's lives, my grandmothers were amazing women, and their lives were so thwarted by misogyny, by sexism, and they never got to be the people they could have been. They were incredible people, even as it was, but they... They, they never, like my, my Swiss grandmother, she loved to paint and draw. They told her to shut up and get into the kitchen, right? And I think about when people say to me, well, these forces that we have to take on are really powerful. I say to them, you're absolutely right, but they're not a tenth as powerful as men were in 1963. Men controlled every country in the world, every company in the world, pretty much, every institution of power in the world. And they had, ever since those institutions of power had been invented, with the exception of a handful of hereditary queens along the way, right? And, and I think about, I don't want to underestimate for a second how much further we've got to go in terms of achieving liberation for women. But when I think about the gap between my grandmother's lives and say my niece's life, my niece Erin is 17, and um, she never knew my grandmother, either of them, but my niece loves to draw and paint. And when my niece loved to draw and paint, we didn't say shut up and get into the kitchen. We started Googling art schools. Um, and I think my grandmother would have been really proud of that and proud of that progress, which is not to say there isn't a huge amount more progress to do. And I apologize. I, I know it's annoying for a man to mansplain this to you because you know it much better than I do, but enormous changes can happen. Women in 1963 could have said, fucking hell, we're never going to beat this, right? This has been for the whole of human history. It's been like this. We're how are we ever going to take on these people? Right? This is a much more achievable fight than feminism would have seemed in 1963. And we're not talking about a million years ago. I loved these women. I knew them really well. This is when they were, they were the age I am now. So I would say they want us, these forces, to feel daunted, to feel like they're all powerful, like there's nothing we can do. You know, James Williams, who I mentioned before, he said to me, the axe existed for 1.4 million years before anyone had the idea to put a handle on it. The entire internet has existed for less than 10,000 days. We can deal with this. And the other 11 causes of our attention crisis that I write about in Stolen Focus, these are relatively recent phenomena, right? We don't, this is not a force of nature. We can deal with these things. But in the moment, we're, at the moment we're in a race, right? The way I think of it is one side of the race is these 12 factors, many of which are on course to become more invasive. Think about Paul Graham, one of the biggest investors in Silicon Valley said the world will become more addictive in the next 40 years than it was in the last 40. Think about how much more addictive TikTok is to your daughter than Facebook is, right? Imagine the next iteration and the next iteration. So that's one side of the race, right? 
on the other side of the race, there's got to be a movement of all of us saying, no, no, you don't get to do this to us. This is not a good life. We want a life where we can think deeply, where we can read books, where we can have conversations, where our children can play outside, where we look into each other's eyes. That is a good life. What you are giving us is not a good life. We do not accept it. We will not allow it. And um, we choose something better. We can do that if we want to, right? We can absolutely do that if we want to, but we have to fight for it. We won't get, you know, you know Elizabeth Warren said once, you don't get what you don't fight for. Right. I want to stress, I obviously mean peacefully fight. I don't want anyone to hurt anyone. You don't get what you don't fight for. We've got to fight for our attention. We've got to decide that we value it and we've got to fight for it. But how are we going to do this with this competing AI and technology? That one aspect of it is developing so rapidly and people love it. People are addicted. People say it's making their lives better. It reminds them of the birthdays that you need to get your hair cut, that you need to get your, people love it, that their refrigerator can talk to them and say, hey, Anna, you're running out of eggs. Hey, uh, you don't need to even go to the grocery store. Your groceries can come to you. People love the conveniences of this. I, I tend to have a more pessimistic view on this, and I'm so happy you have a more optimistic. I do agree that we have to start a movement. I agree on that. How far we can go, how much we can change, I'm not sure. But why do we need to go and change Facebook currently? Why can't we create a new social media, for example, with more humane qualities and features? Why do these people, the, the ones you mentioned, Tristan Harris and Aza and all of those people, why can't they create something that is more humane? Will people gravitate towards that while Facebook exists? Let me tell you something. Uh, I don't want to argue with you, but this is a point because they can create that now. And let's see, do people gravitate towards that? They leave their favorite Facebooks and Instagrams and TikToks. I'm curious about that. More people are, I, I was talking to a mom the other day at my daughter's volleyball tournament. She's older than me. And she said, do you want to see what I do during my spirit time? This is how I entertain myself. She's on TikTok making stupid TikToks. And I'm like, I can't <laughs> believe this woman is 56 years old. She is spending so much time on TikTok. And obviously I was very judgmental in my mind. Even my, even my <laughs> daughter, she listen. And <laughs> even, even my daughter deleted TikTok. She says, mom, this is a stupid waste of time. <laughs> First, I want a different kind of social media, the one that you and all these people dream of, more humane, uh, we can push the button and meet friends, all of that. I want that to exist. If it's so simple, let them create that. And let's see that we all gravitate towards that because we can't go and change Facebook. I, I think we will lose that battle. Did, they, so, uh, did Facebook us, start, um, one more comment, I'm going to forget this. When Facebook <laughs> first started, Johan, they didn't start with the current grubby, greedy model. It was all about connecting with your college friends and blah, blah, blah. It started with a simple idea, but it grew into this monster. And I think whatever we create with technology is going to go to that route because human beings are inherently greedy. And I, I'm not sure if this is going to, or this is my opinion, obviously. So yeah, take it from oh, me. So I need to introduce you to my friend, Rutger Bregman, the great Dutch historian who wrote a great book called Humankind, which is about how we do have these greedy aspects of our character, but we also have just as strongly in our character. We have both. Approach. Yes, yeah, I, I strongly both. agree. Yes. So it's not that the negative always wins. No, out. no. But, but just to give a very concrete example before we, I want to come back to something you said a minute ago that I think is really interesting. But do you have a concrete example about how we can take on these companies? So as you know, a lot of the advertising that used to go to newspapers now just goes straight onto Facebook. But people access newspaper stories through Facebook. They see them in their feed. So what was happening was basically Facebook was taking all the advertising and profiting from the fact that newspapers still produce the news, but the money goes to Facebook, right? So the Australian Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who I have to say, a centre-right figure, not someone I like or admire normally, hugely to his credit, said, look, Facebook, you are bankrupting the Australian media. This is not reasonable. What you need to do is you need to start sharing your ad revenue 
with the media, with newspapers, right? So they earmark, they said, from now on, a percentage of the money that you make for advertising has to go to the media because you profit from the fact the media create all this. People go to Facebook to get the news. We need to pay the people who actually produce the news, right? It's essential for democracy apart from anything else. And Facebook went crazy. They screamed, they shouted, they threatened to cut the whole of Australia off from Facebook, right? And then what happened? Quietly, they capitulated. Because ultimately, we're more powerful than them. Governments and people are more powerful than Facebook by a long way. So whenever in the world this is tested, whenever people do stand up to Facebook, it works. So I think that's a healthy encouragement for us. But just to go back to the thing you said before, because I think it's really interesting to think this through, Anna, and I think it's really interesting you're, you're very articulately putting this point, which I thought about a lot when I was working on it, which is what you're... So the thing you said before something, I'm going to say it slightly wrong, but you said people love it, they're addicted. I would separate out those two statements, right? <laughs> so I think it's what's happening is it's complicated. I think people love social media the way I love KFC. I love KFC. If there was no cost to my health, I would eat KFC once a day, possibly more, right? Like, I love it. But I know that eating KFC comes with a terrible cost, right? I mean, usually quite quickly, you actually feel literally nauseous immediately after you've eaten it, right? Uh, one of my friends always jokes, that's why it comes in a bucket, so you can just vomit it back up. Um, <laughs> so, so I think what, what we have to do is help people to understand the costs that come with the things they like, firstly, and I'll come back to that in a second. And secondly, we have to explain to people, actually, you can have loads of the really good things from this technology. I don't want us all to convert to the Amish. I love technology. There's loads of great things about tech. That thing you named about your fridge being able to tell you you need to restock stuff, that's great. I've got no problem. That doesn't harm your attention. That, in fact, enhances your life, right? You don't have to worry about, oh, have I got enough eggs? The fridge will tell you. Brilliant. But, 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 but because the reason your fridge knows that you need eggs is because of those other sites that you visited that profiled you to know. No, 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 no that's not true. They Anna. took no, your no, no. attention already. No, 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 no. The fridge, the fridge knows it because the fridge has sensors in it that detect eggs. Is it? The, the fridge isn't monitoring your social media and seeing if you told your mom, I haven't got enough eggs and then telling it, right? <laughs> no, 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 that's just the fridge. That's a different thing. That's more like a, Is it? you know, that's, yeah, that, yeah that, I would say I put that in a different category. But I think in terms of explaining the costs to people, how would I put it? I would tell them about, for example, one, there's lots of costs, obviously, and I go through loads of them in the book, but let's think about one. I went to interview a man named Professor Earl Miller, who's one of the leading neuroscientists in the world. He's at MIT, where I interviewed him. And he said to me, look, there's one thing you've got to understand about the human brain more than anything else. You can only consciously think about one or two things at a time. That's it. This is a fundamental limitation of the human brain. The human brain has not significantly changed in 40,000 years. It's not going to change anytime soon. You can only think about one or two things at a time. But what's happened is we've fallen for a big delusion. The average American teenager now believes they can follow six or seven things at the same time, forms of media. So what happens is scientists get people into labs, not just teenagers, older people, and they get them to think they're doing lots of things at the same time. And what they discover every time is you can't do more than one thing at a time. What you do is you juggle very rapidly between the tasks. You don't realize you're doing it, but you are. And that comes with a really big cost. The technical term for it is the switch cost effect. And what it shows is when you try and do more than one thing at a time, you will do all the things you're trying to do much less competently. You'll make more mistakes. You'll be less creative. You'll remember much less of what you do. And this isn't a small effect. If you receive just eight text messages in an hour, one study by Professor Larry Rosen found, it lowers your brain power for the main thing you're trying to focus on by 30%. Eight text messages isn't much. I would argue most of us are losing something like that 30% a lot of the time, right? And um, another study found that being chronically distracted was twice as bad for your intelligence as getting stoned on cannabis, right? You'd be better off getting stoned than you would being constantly distracted all the time. I, think about that woman, right? The woman you're talking about who makes the TikTok videos. I'm sure she gets some pleasure out of making this TikTok videos, and I'm not opposed to TikTok, right? But that's going to come with a cost for her. And just like I could sincerely sit here and tell you how much I love KFC, I could talk for ages about the things I like on the KFC menu, and I would do it with real enthusiasm. And then you say, Johan, here's a picture of you when you were obese, right? Because I had a period of my life where I was obese. I would go, 
shit, you're right. I can't have a KFC tonight, right? In the same way, it's not about denying people. We don't want to deny the pleasures. And many of the pleasures, by the way, we can keep in this adjusted world, just like we still have paint. We still have gasoline. We just don't have leaded paint and leaded gasoline. We firstly, a lot of those pleasures can be maintained. And secondly, where they can't, I do think most people can understand there are costs to these things. That, that it's about helping people to connect the cost to the harmful behavior and then empowering them with different alternatives, right? Because what most people want is good tech that doesn't invade our, invade, deliberately invade our attention, right? That's what most people want. That's something that we can get. That's not an unrealistic thing. Just like you think about obesity, right? The United States, a majority of Americans are overweight or obese. In the Netherlands, 13% of people are overweight and obese. Why, why such a big gap, right? If it was just that humans just want to stuff their faces, uh, that would not be the case because they're humans in the Netherlands and they're humans in the United States. What happened is in the, in the Netherlands, they deliberately designed an environment that reduces obesity, right? They build cities that it's possible to bike and walk around. They deliberately subsidize healthy food, whereas in the US we subsidize unhealthy food. Um, and they have policies that reduce people's stress, which makes them less likely to overeat. So they constructed an environment that helps people to make better choices, right? In the same way, we can construct an environment that helps people to make better attentional choices. That, that's not, we know how to do it. I've been to places that did it. In France, in New Zealand, I saw specific examples that I write about in the book of big changes they made that really improved people's ability to focus and pay attention. We can do this. Um, they want us to be pessimists, right? The, 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 from the food industry to to big tech, the forces that are benefiting from the current status quo, which is so profoundly harming our attention, they want you to think that you're powerless. Just like men wanted women to think they were powerless in 1963, right? They want to think, you think you're going to change this? You're never going to change this. This is just the way the world is. That's what they want us to think. It's not true. We can take our minds back if we want to, but it does require a shift in psychology. You know, we have to realize we are not medieval peasants begging at the court of King Zuckerberg for a few little crumbs of attention from his table. We are the free citizens of democracies and we own our own minds and we can take them back if we want to. I think, Johan, that this is a great place to end this conversation because we can go endlessly and, and talk about that. This is so oh, much. It's so interesting. This is the, so the, interesting. The, yes, this is so interesting. I want people to get the book, to read it to use it in their book clubs, to discuss oh. it widely. I'll have the links in the show notes where people can get the book. I am so thrilled you were able to join and have this conversation. It's just a phenomenal book. I highly recommend oh. it to everyone. And uh, I wish you so much success in your future book. And hopefully we can start this movement. Let's uh, do it attention re rebellion <laughs> we can do it and Anna it's been such a pleasure to talk to you you've asked such intelligent and thoughtful questions um I'm still recovering from the bombshell that you've never had a KFC so we are going to break that next well, time I'm in Princeton when you're, when you're in in the United States let's have KFC together I've got, I've got to come to Princeton later in the year so we're, I'm definitely going to take you to KFC um, I'm also meant to say if my uh, my publishers tase me if I don't say this anyone who wants to know where to get the audio book the ebook or the physical book you can basically get them anywhere but if you go to stolen Folk Focusbook.com. You can also listen for free on the website to interviews with loads of the people that we talked about. Yes. Oh, I yeah, did. Yes, I did listen people. to them. They are. Yes, I love those people. And yeah. um, you can also see. This always feels ironic. You can see where to follow me on social media. You won't hear from me much. And what's the other thing I meant to? I'm also meant to say you can get the book from all good bookshops. But I always feel like saying you can also get it from shitty bookshops. It's not like it's not like we have a quality test. We say no, your bookshop's not good enough to stock style and focus. Yeah. So what a pleasure. Thank you so much, Anna. I really enjoyed this. If people have the attention capacity to read the book, my 14, <laughs> my 14 year old daughter is reading the book. Oh. And her favorite part so far is the cost switch effect because oh. she, she used to be like a typical teenager, a computer, a Chromebook, a phone, everything is going at the same time. Now she's very mindful. She's like, mom, it's going to take 23 minutes to refocus <laughs> myself. She hides her phone somewhere else. So you are changing people's lives. It's, I meant to say that earlier. I, I love it, Johan. Thank you so much. I, oh, what a I, pleasure. I adore you. Yes. Oh, what a joy. Thank you. Really cheered me up. Cheers, Anna. Thanks so much. Thank you.